Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Calvin Coolidge, and the focus is state leadership. Here is 1913, Coolidge moving up the political ladder. Most recently, he had been the mayor of Northampton, and then the last couple of years serving in the state Senate. Well, he was thinking maybe to move up to the president of that body. For that, he needed an opening, and perhaps he would get one because Levi Greenwood, who had been the president of the Senate, announced he was going to run for lieutenant governor. So Coolidge thought this was his chance. The members of the Senate elect their own president, so all he had to do was to win his office for a third term and then see if he could get that vote. Well, Greenwood then put a little bit of a wrench into this whole thing because he changed his mind. Not going to run for lieutenant governor, he's going to run for his Senate seat, but then another twist he lost that race. He got on the wrong side of the suffragist in his district. He was not sent back to Boston, and that had the opening for Calvin Coolidge. And for a rare time in his political career, he got aggressive. He took this opportunity to actually go take the spot, not just let it come to him. He took a night train from Northampton to Boston so he could be there the day after the election in the morning to get started on sort of rallying the future senators for the next term to see if they would vote for him. And he had some help. Murray Crane, his political mentor, the senator from Massachusetts, the former governor. Crane got his network of folks involved, which certainly was helpful, but also Coolidge himself. The last couple of years, he had been quietly helping and doing favors for many of his colleagues, including those across the aisle. He never asked for anything in return. This was all just about good government as far as Coolidge was concerned, but now maybe it was a chance to ask for something in return. And sure enough, within 24 hours, he had the pledges of a majority of the next uh, term senators to put him in the presidency. Chair. It all happened so fast, the Springfield Republican Road, it was nothing short of wonderful. The way he, Coolidge, walked right into the ring and took the prize before the public could realize there was a contest. A little bit unusual approach for Coolidge, but certainly paid off. This was the biggest leap in his career to date. So everybody gathered January 7th, 1914, for his inauguration as the president of the Senate in Massachusetts. His whole family was there. His father came down from Vermont. He gave one of his more famous addresses. It was called Have Faith in Massachusetts, which actually became the title of a book that was published of Coolidge's speeches a little bit later. And you see the themes from Charles Garman, that professor he had in philosophy and ethics uh, back at Amherst, Really, you can see those themes coming through many of Coolidge's political speeches, including this one. Recognize the immortal worth and dignity of man, he said. Let the laws of Massachusetts proclaim to our humblest citizen, performing the most menial task, the recognition of his manhood, the recognition that all men are peers, the humblest with the most exalted, the recognition that all work is glorified. Such is the path to equality before the law. Such is the foundation of liberty under the law. Such is the sublime revelation of man's relation to man, democracy. The words of Calvin Coolidge echoing the thoughts of Charles Garman. Well, the president of the Senate in Massachusetts actually had quite a bit of authority. Set the Senate calendar, name committee members, preside over sessions, and for this, Coolidge did it with discipline, he did it with efficiency. With Coolidge, you didn't waste time, you move forward, coming on to the next topic. Personally, for Coolidge, there was basically no change. He was still shy, still mostly a loner. He rarely socialized. He still kept that tiny room at the Adams House Hotel for a dollar a day. Grace and the boys, they were in Northampton, and so he would continue to commute by train. Monday morning, he'd leave for Boston. Fridays, he'd head back to Northampton, where he would spend the weekends. Now, in this uh, time period, a new uh, member of Coolidge's very small inner circle, very small inner circle, would enter, and that's the person of Frank Stearns. Frank Stearns was a wealthy local businessman in Boston. In fact, his father had started and owned one of the top department stores in Boston. Frank Stearns had very little, in fact, no political background. He had gone to Amherst. He had become a trustee of Amherst. And in 1912, he had gone to see Senator Cal Calvin Coolidge, because he wanted to lobby to enlarge a legislation to enlarge the sewer system at Amherst. At Amherst, and Coolidge, frankly, was terse with him. He basically said, "Nope, can't help you. It's too late in the legislative session." And Frank Stearns was not happy. In fact, he stewed over this for months. But then something unusual happened in Stearns' mind because quietly, at the very beginning of the next legislative session, Coolidge introduced the bill that uh, that Stearns had wanted. It passed, and he thought. This guy's a little bit different. Here's a politician that does stuff, gets things done. He was intrigued. He was intrigued about becoming Coolidge's friend. 
his political partner, maybe a backer. This was the start of a very important relationship. So big picture, you have to understand also what's happening in the world right now. It's 1914, assassination in Europe of Austria's Archduke Franz Ferdinand. World War I erupts almost immediately. The United States under President Woodrow Wilson, policy of neutrality, not going to get directly involved. And most Americans, including Calvin Coolidge at the time, uh, at least for the time being, respected that decision and, and they're basically focused on life in the United States. For Coolidge, that meant the focus on his job as the president of the Senate of Massachusetts. Now, he was elected then for a fourth term. This time he was elected uh, for the president of the Senate unanimously. Even the Democrats were on board. And this gets Frank Stearns thinking the next rung on the ladder, maybe lieutenant governor for Calvin Coolidge. And for this, he's got to do some work behind the scenes to rally some support. So he gives a dinner at the exclusive Algonquin Club in Boston. Some of the academic and political elites from the entire state were invited. Big honor for Coolidge that, that he uh, was, was proud to have. But again, this wasn't his focus. He was focused on, on his job. And in fact, he was frustrating Stearns because Coolidge wasn't giving him the okay to go jump into the ring for lieutenant governor while other candidates had already announced and were basically stumping for the position for the Republican nomination. Well, that changed in the summer when the legislative session ended and and Coolidge had felt, he didn't tell Stearns this at the time, he felt there was a conflict of interest. He had to focus on his job first, the next political office later. Now that the legislative session was over, he gave Stearns the go-ahead, and he ran. He gets the Republican nomination, and then he runs for lieutenant governor on the ticket with Samuel McCall. So McCall is the gubernatorial candidate at the top of the list, and then Coolidge is his number two. They stump together, and Coolidge, basically, his stumping message was everything about McCall. This is what the top of the ticket is. It's the important piece. I'm certainly along to do my job as well, but his focus in the campaigning was much at the top of the ticket. The final election came in, in November, and Calvin Coolidge, Samuel McCall, they both win. In fact, Coolidge got a larger margin of victory than the governor, and Frank Stearns, again, had a lot to do with this. You know, the relationship between Coolidge and Stearns was very close uh, as, it, as it progressed over time, and Coolidge later said that while Mr. Stearns always overestimated me, he nevertheless was a great help to me. He never obtruded or sought any favor for himself or any other person. His whole effort was always disinterested and entirely devoted to assisting me when I indicated I wished him to do so. It's doubtful if any other public man ever had so valuable and unselfish a friend. And that was the key to this relationship. Stearns was there to help Coolidge any way he could. He asked for nothing. Coolidge didn't really understand this very much at first. Then he came to accept it. Then he came to embrace it. And this became, again, a critical relationship for Coolidge going forward, both professionally and personally. Now, for the lieutenant governor, had many different jobs, and they were important roles in the state of Massachusetts. He was the chair of the executive council, which was responsible for overseeing a number of commissions, approving appointments by the governor, and also serve as acting governor at times, whenever the governor was out of the state. And since Governor McCall liked to travel, travel gave Coolidge quite a bit of opportunity actually to be the acting governor. But the most important role for Coolidge as lieutenant governor was to support the boss. He told Stearns that I apprehend that I was elected by the people of Massachusetts to a definite job, second in the administration, a long ways behind the first. I accepted the office and my duty is perfectly clear to back up the administration to the limit whether I like it or do not like it. If this position should ever be so bad that I positively cannot do this, then my duty is equally clear to keep my mouth shut. Very clear in his role, support the top of the ticket. Again, personally, Lieutenant Governor, no change. Grace and the boys stay in North Northampton. Coolidge, single small room at the Adams House. Again, mostly kept to himself. Back to the national scene for a moment. 1916, as we move forward, a national election, and Woodrow Wilson is going up against Charles Evans Hughes for the Republicans. It turns out to be a very close race. Wilson squeaks by by winning California, uh, the closest of all the states at the very end, puts him over the top. He gets four more years in the White House. Now, he had run on a campaign to keep the United States out of war. But a month after his reelection, Germany changed its policy and adopted this motive of unrestricted submarine warfare. A lot of war hawks had been pushing Wilson to get into the 
to get into the fight on behalf of the Allies. He had resisted and resisted, but this move by the Germans actually put him over the top. He asked for and got a declaration of war, and the United States was getting into the conflict. For uh, Calvin Coolidge, he's a lieutenant governor, a lot of preparation to do to get the Massachusetts contingent to support the war. And he said that the whole nation seemed to be endowed with a new spirit, unified and solidified, willing to make any sacrifice for the cause of liberty. The response which the people made and the organizing power of the country were all manifestations that it was wonderful to contemplate. The entire nation awoke to a new life. 189,000 men and women got involved in the, in the armed forces for the United States from Massachusetts in World War I, including 5,775 who perished. The traditionally in Massachusetts for the top jobs, governor, lieutenant governor, there was sort of an unofficial policy, three terms is the limit. These were one-year terms in Massachusetts at the time. It was about to change to two-year terms, but for now, still one-year terms. And McCall announced that he was going to step aside during his third term. He was not going to run for a fourth. He would abide by tradition. So all eyes on Calvin Coolidge. And of course, Frank Stearns among the first to push Coolidge's name to the top of the next ticket to run for governor. In fact, Stearns basically financed the entire campaign out of his own pop, created about $6,000 he tossed in there. As Coolidge went up against the Democrat Richard Long, who was a shoe manufacturer who'd actually recently retooled his factory to help produce uh, products for the war. So you have Long going up against Coolidge. Now, Coolidge checked all the boxes you would expect at this point for a governor. He had done all the different rungs on the ladder. He had all the experience. Yes, he was quirky. He was quiet, but he was competent, principled, fair, hardworking, and he wins this vote. Close vote, 51% for Calvin Coolidge, but he's going to become the 48th governor of Massachusetts. Just a week later, the armistice is signed in Europe, so Coolidge would not be a wartime governor, but he would oversee demobilization, many of the post-war challenges, labor relations, women in the workforce, uh, all kinds of issues related to getting the, the workforce back engaged from a post-war perspective. These were many of the issues that were going to face Coolidge as the new governor. The biggest question for Coolidge, though, was could he lead, which of course is a big responsibility in executive positions. And Coolidge had only had one truly executive position where he was at the top before, and that was when he was the mayor of Northampton, where a city of 18,000 people. Governor of Massachusetts, 3.8 million people at the time. Was he ready to take on that kind of leadership? That was to be seen. Again, personal life. No change. Grace Coolidge said, Mr. Coolidge may be governor of Massachusetts, but I shall be first of all the mother of my sons. Although my husband has moved up, it makes no difference in our mode of living. Why should it? We are happy, well, content. We keep our bills paid and live like anybody else. They would continue to still rent the duplex on Massasoit Street. That's where Grace and the boys would stay in Northampton. Coolidge would commute. He made one change though, his tiny little room in the Adams House Hotel. Finally, he upgraded to a two-room suite with a bathroom. $2 a day instead of one for the governor of Massachusetts. Now, one of the big things that Coolidge did as governor was welcome back returning soldiers from uh, the war. The 26th Yankee Division made up a lot of folks from Massachusetts, but also other states in New England. They came home to a massive celebration that Coolidge and the other governors uh, presided over. But first, the biggest welcome for Coolidge was to welcome the commander in chief, Woodrow Wilson, to Boston. Now, Wilson, the president, had actually gone to Paris to participate, in fact, lead the U.S. delegation delegation at the Paris peace talks after the war. Well, he had to take a break to come back to the United States to sign some legislation before the Congress went into recess. And his right hand, Colonel Edward House, suggested, you know what? Go to Boston, land there, you'll get a great reception. And by the way, there was some political nature of this as well, because Wilson's biggest uh, antagonist on the key issue of the League of Nations that Wilson was pushing was a senator from Massachusetts by the name of Henry Cabot Lodge. And so you got that dynamic as another reason perhaps to have Wilson land in Massachusetts. Well, Coolidge didn't play politics with any of this. He was happy to welcome the president. And he said that we welcome him as the representative of a great people, as a great statesman, as one to whom we have entrusted our destinies, and one whom we are sure we will support in the future in the working out of those destinies, as Massachusetts has supported him in the past. Wilson got a much better reception in Boston, in fact, than when he went to Washington, D.C., where many of the Lodge Republicans came out 
quite publicly against what Wilson was negotiating for, so he had those headaches as he was heading back to Paris. Well, Calvin Coolidge was asked about the League of Nations. He said, look, not in my job jar. This is not something I'm focused on, uh, and he's going to focus on the people and his job in Massachusetts. For that, a lot was about the economy. And for Coolidge, he really embraced a new provision in the state constitution, which centralized the budget making in the state in the executive branch under the governor. So he had a unified budget opportunity, and he used this to actually cut spending by about $4 million in his first year. He also was, uh, one of the things he did was he vetoed the salary increase for the state legislatures uh, as part of that effort to keep costs down. Uh, for, these were some of the themes that would come forward for Coolidge in uh, public office yet to come about the budget, cutting costs, these are some of his themes. Now, again, no change for Coolidge personality-wise. He was quiet as ever. But interestingly, he actually didn't like to be alone very much. And so what would he do sometimes? Well, he'd call Frank Stearns and have Stearns come over. Maybe they would talk a little bit in the governor's office, but sometimes they would literally just sit there, smoke cigars for a while. And when Coolidge was done, ready to go back to work, Stearns would leave. And both were perfectly happy with this. They were helping each other out. This was a unique friendship that was working well for both. One of the biggest issues on the national map, labor management relations in this post-war environment. Very tense times across the country. And in fact, Massachusetts was about to become ground zero on this topic and a real test for Calvin Coolidge, the governor, a test he would pass with flying colors. But that's a story for another day. That's Calvin Coolidge and state leadership from the life of Calvin Coolidge. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.